speaking to you today will be Linda Wilkinson. Um, she's the director of QA for Evisions Incorporated. And um, she brings over 25 years of experience in the field of QA and QC. Um, which means that her list of credentials is so long that I could easily fill these 45 minutes, which I'm not going to do. Uh, we want to hear the talk. Um, suffice it to say that uh, she's very passionate about quality in general and um, that she is dedicated to solving the complex problems in quality with simpler solutions, with mentoring, and um, she has a focus on team building, I think. So that's what we're going to hear today, how we can build better test sets and better test teams together. Linda. Welcome to PNSQC. Um, are you hearing me all right at the, at the back of the room? All right, all good. Let's go. Some of the key points in what we're going to talk about today is agile methodology and collaboration, rethinking our agile processes, uh, evolving our test methodologies, uh, perspective and confirmation biases, and collaborative testing. And that sounds a little dry right now, but it really isn't. What I want to talk about first is Agile methodology. Agile is no longer new. And I have to, I, I tend to, to uh, walk when I talk, so you'll have to forgive me. But Agile is no longer new. Agile has been around for at least 15 years. I think it's 20 years since I've worked on a, a waterfall methodology type of, of product. And during that time, Agile has, has evolved and changed from, I think in the beginning, the, the newest, the latest, greatest thing was XP. And that was throwing around index cards and but, but the main thing about Agile, what I love about Agile, is that when you distill it to its essence, what Agile methodology is, is enabling and authorizing a team to collaborate together in order to produce something of, of value to an end client or a customer. So it's all about that collaboration piece. And that's a defining element of an Agile team. If you have a truly Agile team, it doesn't matter what the methodology is because they are free, they are authorized to either use elements that are supposed to be part of that methodology or they can throw them out. Whatever works for their team. So if you're working on Scrum and you need to have planning, you need to have story time, you need to have um, two or three week sprints, um, you need to have a retrospective. If the team as a whole decides having a retrospective every two weeks is not valuable, they can choose to not do that as a team. The whole, the crux of an Agile team is collaboration and that's what I like about it. And those are some of the things that have changed over the, the past 15 years. Agile teams have become more and more collaborative. So let's talk a little bit about collaboration. Collaboration is methodology agnostic. I get, I, I, I have had arguments many, many times with people in the field because they go, waterfall, oh my god, waterfall, bad, 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 bad. Rup, bad, 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 bad. Agile, good, <laughs> okay? I, I've worked on waterfall teams that were successful, and I've worked on waterfall teams that were not successful. I've worked on agile teams that have been successful, and I've worked on many, many agile teams that were very unsuccessful. Well, why, why is that? What's the difference between a successful and an unsuccessful team? It's how collaborative they are. People think that, Waterfall was not collaborative. Well, I lived through that time. There were collaborative waterfall teams and they were successful. An agile team can be very uncollaborative. They're normally uncollaborative with other teams that have information they need to be successful. 
but all the same, an agile team can be uncollaborative. And a lot of people don't, don't think about that because agile, the whole, the whole premise of agile is built on collaboration. And that's what I love about agile teams. The fact that, that the methodology itself supports collaboration, and collaboration is the key to success regardless of project methodology. So uh, overall, in, and this is, this is what I'm presenting to you, is that um, testing evolution has not really kept up with the Agile world. Let's, let's talk about standard test methodologies. Development develops something, they turn it over to a, a third party, uh, a testing resource, uh, the testing resource writes tests, or they don't if they're doing, um, if they're doing a, a more exploratory form of testing, but they do the testing, they report bugs, and the process starts over. That is very waterfallish. But the odd thing is many, many Agile teams follow that exact process. They do it maybe during a two or three week period, but they're still doing that. They develop something, they turn it over, it's tested, it goes back, right? There is no collaboration there. Exploratory testing is, is almost, and, and this will be controversial to some people, is almost less collaborative than that because exploratory testing is you turn a product over to a testing resource and they go off and explore it, right? It, it doesn't from, unlike a standard test methodology, it doesn't necessarily force or encourage collaboration up front. And what happens is a team gets used to just throwing something over the wall for a hopefully a very talented uh, QA testing person to exercise their code and explore and find errors in that code. TDD and automation, this is another way in which Agile has changed the, the testing landscape. It, if you look 15 years ago, there wasn't, there wasn't such a focus on TDD, which is test-driven development, and automation. And now, if you're a testing professional and you don't have automation experience, it's very, very difficult to get a job. There's still jobs out there, but it's very, very difficult. Often what a testing resource does on an Agile team is they may actually, during that test-driven development, they may actually do the automation themselves. They actually may do the coding for that unit testing for the test-driven development team. So we're failing to take advantage of, of some of the basic premises of Agile. Agile is about collaboration. Where is the collaboration in this process? Where is it encouraged? And yes, if you have a testing resource on your team, or maybe you don't have a QA team. Maybe that's all handled by development staff. Where is the collaboration encouraged and where does it take place? So what I'm going to talk about today is evolving our testing processes so that they are more agile. In order to do that, and the reason that this is, was an advanced topic, and this is a management topic, is we need to rethink some things that have been standard for a very, very long time. If you're familiar with stories, are most of you in this room familiar with user stories? Is it your standard way to produce requirements? Yes? Okay. Within a, a story is something called acceptance criteria, right? So acceptance criteria is, is a list of things that, that must work in order for an end user or a client to be satisfied, right? I, as a tester, 
have never found acceptance criteria very useful. It's not useful for writing tests. It's too vague and it's too basic. And if you think about it from a, a real user's perspective, there are a lot of things going on in the background that actually have to work and have to pass before it's suitable for use by them. For example, if you make a change to software, isn't your end user going to assume that everything that was working is still working? And yet, is regression testing part of your acceptance criteria? Probably not. They're, they're going to assume if they make a mistake, the, the system is going to tell them something um, reasonable so they can go back and they can correct their error. Or um, it will not permit them to make certain errors. There are going to be assumptions, maybe, that there's some security around what you're doing, which is a non-functional requirement. Those are just assumptions, and they are very rarely in acceptance criteria. So what does acceptance criteria actually provide to the Agile team? In my experience, not enough. Not what it could or it should provide. To me, some of the best teams that I've worked with, some of, the, some of the, the best development teams I've worked with, have been enabled by having outstanding test sets. That means the development staff, they know exactly what is going to be tested against their software. They know that in advance. They know that before they even start coding which is part of test-driven development as well, but on a, on a much broader basis. Test-driven development is normally focused at a unit level. Acceptance criteria doesn't have that kind of limitation. So what you can do is you can decide as an agile team, as, as a leader, as, as a manager or director or a thought leader within your company to improve your acceptance criteria and therefore improve the ability of your development staff to produce code that is low in error. If I as a developer know uh, you are going to test these 20 things, I'm going to be keeping that in mind when I develop my code. If I only know you're going to hit these two acceptance criteria, then it's going to be somewhat different. Then I'll be thinking of those things, but maybe not the other 18 things that, that are part of the picture. So the more I as a developer understand and know about what my code actually needs to do, the better off I'm going to be. So what I'm actually proposing is rethinking acceptance criteria on user stories. Collaborative testing, what I want to do with collaborative testing and what I've done with the teams that I work with is raise the quality bar and bring our testing processes into the Agile era. In a lot of cases and in many companies for which I've worked, that has not been the case. The Agile team is Agile. The testing team still struggles, or the testers still struggle. I want to provision the Agile team for success. So I want developers to have absolutely everything they need to be successful and to bring their error rates down early, which is always cheaper. I want to solve and address problems early in the process. If you wait to start determining what your test set needs to be, until later in the process, what happens is your testing resource is asking pertinent questions and defining questions too late in the process. You want to move that as far up in the process as you can. And it not only benefits your testing resource, it benefits the development team because it helps them define what they need to produce and what they need to do. And it helps uh, define what questions the team has that they need to ask another team. 
I want to address agile recommendations of early involvement in a concrete way. If you go out and you look at, at any agile website that's talking about agile, they always recommend the QA or the testing resource be involved very early in the process, but they don't tell you how. How do you do that? Okay, you have them, well, involved in the planning, you have them giving their estimates, but how do you really get them involved early in the process? This helps address those kind of questions. I want to talk about perspective and testing excellence. There are, every one of us, and we'll get into this a little later, has some biases in, in terms of, of how we test and what we look at. And all of us have a different perspective. And, and in the very beginning, the, the way QA as a field, testing as a field came about um, many moons ago, is that it became evident we needed a third party, independent set of eyes looking at, at what we're doing. Well, well, why is that? Let's talk about perspective. Let's talk about the perspective of a developer. Nobody knows their code better than a developer does. So you talk about path testing or you talk about unit testing and you talk about TDD. The reason those things are successful, one of the reasons those are successful, is that a developer knows all the paths into and out of their code. They are, by necessity, very dependent on mocks. They need to mock data coming in and where their data is going because those things may not be developed yet. So, but a developer understands more about what comes into what, how that data is massaged and where it goes than anyone else on the team. Often, however, what they are focused on is proving their code works. And I, I have these, I've had these vibrant discussions with a lot of people, um, but it's, we're going to talk about it when we talk about confirmation biases. But um, most developers are, are trying to prove that their code works. They also have very limited time available. So the amount of time that they have to explore uh, what happens if this record is not in the right state? What happens if I produce more than two pages of data? What happens if, what if? They don't have time for those things. So that's the perspective of the developer is on their code, pass into, pass out of their code, and how they actually massage the data. Let's talk about the perspective of testers. And when I'm teaching just general testing methodology or I'm training people around confirmation biases, um, I, I talk a lot about the perspective of testers. Uh, often a developer is, is concentrating on, on ensuring that their code does the right things. The best testers I have known, and I've known many of them, are actually trying to prove the code does not do what it's supposed to do. At, you know how your mother used to tell you, uh, if you look for the bad in people, that's all you're going to see, right? That's what testers do. <laughs> they're looking for the bad in things, therefore they find more because they're looking at something with a critical eye. And when we talk about, and you can fulfill this, this role without having a professional QA person on your team. If you're a very small company, uh, roles can be assumed by anybody. So you look on your team with, um, who's our devil's advocate? Who, who's, looking, who's looking for things that are wrong instead of things that are right? They can fulfill this role. But the uh, testers, where they excel is looking for those edge cases where this links to this, integration, and uh, confirming error handling. So the perspective of the tester is important. Often developers think that they understand the users and what the users want. They aren't users, they don't use the system every day. 
and they don't necessarily understand what the users want. That's why you often have a product owner or a business analyst on your team. It's their job to understand things from a user perspective. Testers often feel that they represent the user because they're trying to prove things work and they fight for the user to get things fixed if they feel strongly about an error. But testers are not end users. They do not sit and use the system every single day. Uh, they do not, there's an irritation factor, for example. Maybe you have a screen come up with a giant misspelling. Well, you aren't using this system every day. You don't have to look at that screen a thousand times a day, right? So you would rank that as a tester as a very low level error. But it may be a very large level error from a user perspective because it's so irritating. Either that or it may be embarrassing to the company. Maybe it's your company name you misspelled. So something that is actually from a technical perspective a low level error to the end user, to the clients, is actually a, a very high level. So you need a user perspective when you're considering testing. And there are other perspectives as well. Can I maintain this? Can I deliver it? Can I install it? Can I, so there may be DevOps considerations in what you're doing, there are maintenance considerations. There are all kinds of perspectives. So, when I talk about collaborative testing, to my mind, the reason I've defined these three is this is the lowest common denominator. To build a really good comprehensive test set, to replace your acceptance criteria, you need the perspective of the developer, you need the per or developers, you need the perspective of the tester or the testers, and you need the perspective of the user. And they need to collaborate and work together in order to create your test set. Let's talk about structured brainstorming. This is what I love. It, it, this is a very exciting time to be in the field. What I love about Agile is it, it's moving more and more towards structured brainstorming for doing a variety of different types of tasks. How many here, just show of hands, are familiar with lean coffee and use it on a regular basis? Just a few. Uh, lean coffee is a way you can get a group of people together and make some decisions in five minutes. Is this an awesome world we work in or what? The just-in-time testing is a way to use structured brainstorming in order to develop a comprehensive test set. So it's really using everything that, that Agile and collaboration has to offer in order to do a, a concrete task that used to be done by one individual analyzing documentation and writing tests. And it enables the team to do a better job more quickly and earlier in the process. So what I'd like to, I do want to talk about uh, confirmation biases. And I, I may have flipped past that, that slide, and I'm sorry. Uh, confirmation biases are a tendency, if you go out and look at all the studies that have been done, especially recently, you'll see something that in a way is a little bit alarming if you're in the QA, QC testing field. And that is there's a, a strong tendency now for everybody to have a bias towards just testing and ensuring something works. Well, testing that something works is a good thing. All testing is good. But what happens is the minute somebody does something outside of that, that standard happy path, you have errors. You have errors in production. You have, um, you have more errors when, when it hits uh, integration testing. You, have, um, you may not necessarily um, meet the requirements of your client and customer. Um, so 
confirmation biases are moving more and more towards just making sure the basics work and then sending it out the door. Sometimes you can afford to do that. If you are, if what you're producing is for internal use only, you can afford a higher, higher rate of error than you can if you are producing something for the field outside your company and you have competition. If you have competition, uh, one of the defining factors is going to be quality. How, how high is your quality? Are your customers actually waiting for you to bring something out? Or will they just go with the first person that has that kind of technology? And that's where your marketing team comes in and they let you know those kind of things. But unfortunately, we are training people away from critical review. We are training our, our testing staff away from critical review and towards the same kind of confirmation biases that developers have because they're so closely ingrained with the team. It's very hard to maintain that third party criticality. So when I'm working with teams, I, I work towards training them to find error, teaching them it is their job to find error, that it is okay to enjoy finding errors. All of those things that you associate with somebody who's really gifted at testing. People who are gifted at testing love to find errors. So what this, what having a group together to formulate your test set does is it takes away some of those biases. You've got somebody who's interested in ensuring that the product works. That's your, your development staff and the pass into and out of their code work and things are massaged correctly within their code. You have a third party independent set of eyes. You have a testing resource or somebody acting in that role to say, hey, what if I do this? What if this? Should I get an error message? What if, what if? You have them asking those questions. And if those weren't considered, they'll be considered at that time. It's great for the team to ask those questions up front. Then you've got somebody representing the user saying, I don't care about any of that. I just want to know, can I do my job? very different perspective, right? So that's confirmation bias and that's why I feel it's important that you at least have that triumvirate of people involved in coming up with a collaborative test set. So let's talk about how to do that and that's why I've got these rules of engagement up there. I, I was inspired about mm, 12 years ago, I think, by a class that I was fortunate enough to take with Rob Sabarin. And if none of you have taken just-in-time testing uh, class with Rob Sabarin, I highly recommend it. Uh, first of all, he's very entertaining, he's very intelligent. And what it did is it inspired me all those years ago. And I have worked at that kind of process ever since. And I have incorporated into it a lot of elements of agile methodology today. That, so it, it now uh, resembles more of a structured brainstorming, lean coffee type of exercise than what I originally learned, which involved the index cards and all that kind of thing, because it was at a time when XP was very popular. And I'm sure he's changed it since then. But I wanted to talk about uh, how I've used the, the original concept to, uh, to work collaborative testing into, into our daily workflow and what it's done for us. Yes, thank you. Okay, so um, when you are setting up a collaborative test session, uh, there are only a few rules, which is also in keeping with Agile. One is only the coordinator has a laptop. And the reason for that is you want everybody fully engaged. That means they're not on their phone, they're not on a laptop, they are engaged. Uh, there are no stupid ideas. Um, 
shunning, which uh, the teams I've worked with have a blast with this, and I just got a call from a director last week that told me he was shunned and shown the door during a, during a collaborative test session. What that means is you've read the material before you go into the meeting and you're prepared to engage and participate. And if you aren't, if you're trying to read stuff when you're in there, you're asked to leave. It's also time boxed. If you're familiar with Lean Coffee, Lean Coffee is time boxed to five minutes. What I recommend for a collaborative test session is 15. The, it, it can go longer, generally speaking, if your stories are broken down to the level where there are normally five to 10 tests, maybe 15, you can probably do that in 10 to 15 minutes. If, as some of the teams I work with currently have test sets that are 50 to 70 tests, you may have to put aside half an hour or an hour. But you can time box it. Let's talk about working the process. It's very, very simple. All you need is a wall or a whiteboard. You divide it in half. You have valid on one side. You have invalid on the other. What is a valid test? Valid input yields valid output. An invalid test is invalid input is handled in a graceful way by the system. That means an error message or you aren't allowed to do that. And normally I have a third column for questions, things that the team just can't answer. And you start this process, you have a pile of post-it notes and you start the process by saying a test idea out loud. Maybe the user story says, I, as an admin user, am able to log on to the system. Okay? That, that's the statement. Um, and the first idea will be, well, I have an admin profile. That's going to be an assumption and I can log on to the system. That's your first test idea. You say it out loud, you write it on the post-it note, and you slap it up under valid. Yeah? So what do you do about requirement? You said that's a perfect question. It's not a dumb example, because you can also have a column for assumptions and say, we assume there's a user profile, that that already exists. So that way your assumptions are up there too. So then, you, when you say something out loud, it spurs somebody else to say something out loud because your idea spawns another idea and that's, that's how, that's how um, overall Lean Coffee works. It's one idea spawns another idea spawns another idea. Have you ever been in, in one of those, those games or those child's type things where one person says a word and says it to the person next to him who says something to the person next to him and by the time you get to the end, it's something completely different? It's similar to that except you're all focused on the same concept. So if I said ocean, uh, Siri might say fish. And, and you may say um, oars, and, and you may say sailors, and you, but they all have to do with ocean. Well, if you're even more focused on a concept and people are throwing ideas out and they're slapping them up on the board, right? You end up with, with a test set if you have the right people in the room that considers what a user thinks about, what a developer thinks about, and what a tester thinks about and includes everybody's ideas. So what you do is at the end, the, the person who's coordinating the meeting takes all those sticky notes, puts them on a list, sends them to the team. And the team can either add some tests or delete some tests if, if they care to do that. But that's your test set and that's what goes into acceptance criteria. So instead of turning over something that's been pulled into a sprint over to your QA people and to your development people and you work simultaneously but on different tracks really, 
you've collaborated together and established a test set up front. Developers know what's going to be tested. QA has their test set already done. And uh, they are able then to automate that in advance. Um, or they know what they need to work. The users who often have to sign off on something know exactly what's going to be tested and often they opt for just signing off when they see the test results. They don't have to do that themselves. So let me talk about very quickly what we gained. What we gain is a comprehensive test set. We have saved time on the part of the testing resource. We have possibly saved time with the user resource. But let me tell you about a recent case study. My entire company has been trained on this technique. And their error rate went from 69%, which was standard. Those metrics had been taken sprint after sprint after sprint went from 69% to 18%. 18% in two months. In two months. And we took a, a test period for regression testing that was supposed to take 15 days, which is three weeks. And we were able to reduce that to two days. And they looked at me like I had grown two heads when I said, we can do it in two days, right? And I wasn't sure, to tell you the truth, we could do it in two days. <laughs> but we did it in a day and a half. And we found one error that had to be fixed before production. One. And this is with a group that normally produces a 69% error rate. So those are the kind of things you can look at when you work together on your test set. Yes. Um, it, this is a perfect time for that because this is a time for any questions that you have, by the way. That's, that's really all that, that I have in terms of slides. So let's, um, in, in terms of when it's done, it can be done during the planning period. If you have a backlog, for example, and you decide I'm going to pull these 20 things into it, at that time you can schedule your collaborative test sessions. We know, for example, that we allot 15 minutes for, for each user story, and we know roughly, we use Kanban in my company, we know roughly how many stories a team is going to get through in a two-week period. Uh, normally, it, it depends on, on the complexity, but it can be between 12 and 24 stories. So if it's going to be 12 stories, we set aside three hours for this task. Did that answer your question? Okay. Yes. That is our testing staff, but we also have a we have a resource that does nothing but security. So if we have security issues, if we have a story or we have an epic that involves security specifically and we have, we call them into the collaborative um, test sessions so that they can tell us what we need to consider and what we need to do. Exactly. You invite whoever would have some intelligent ideas as far as as test ideas, you invite them to your collaborative test sessions. Yeah. Yes, I do. I think, generally speaking, when you're trying to make decisions or in any kind of brainstorming situation, you want to keep it to the lowest common denominator. And it, it's not that you can't have a large group. You can have a large group and be successful, but it takes more time. So instead of 15 minutes, it might take you an hour. Right? Yes? No, 
normally Uh, very much so. The question was, where do UX and UI designers come into this, this picture? We specifically have stories that revolve around UX and UI design. So what my recommendation would be is, is that either that happen where there are stories specifically for the UX UI team or if that design is incorporated into part of a story that belongs to someone else, that they be invited to the collaborative test session. But you're right, UX and UI design has those tests from a testing perspective almost write themselves, but they certainly demand a different set of test criteria. So. Yes, often. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there was a question back here, yes. An acceptance, actually it fits very well into an acceptance test driven model. Because you have a, a testing resource in there and you have an end uh, user resource in there, you are actually taking your some of your test ideas are going to deal with taking that process all the way through. The other thing is with a testing resource on the team, they can say, you know, when we're testing this, we'll need to ensure that these things are also still working. So they can say, we need to wrap regression testing around this. So they're, they're in that process. Does that make sense? Did that answer your question? Okay. Yes. That's a great question. There, there is no good and there is no bad when you're gathering ideas. What, and, and you as a coordinator, if you're coordinating the session, you have to make sure nobody's saying that's a stupid idea and you argue during the session because they're timed and they need to go quickly. But what the team can do afterwards when they get the list is just decide to strike these because they don't make sense based on what they're doing. The, the whole idea behind this is to get people accustomed to and used to collaborating together on testing. So if you are a member of a team and, and you've been part of this process, you can go back and say, you know, I don't really think that this makes sense because of this and this and this. And then that would just get removed from the list. That's it. Or you may have a new idea and say, or a change may come through where, oh, this story has changed a little bit. We need to change the test set. Yes? Yes. Mm -hmm. Somebody on the team needs to own the test set. You know how I talked about somebody has to fulfill that test role? In the company I work for now and all the other companies in which I've introduced this, this idea, it is always the either QA or QC or it's the tester that owns the test set. So if something changes for the team, they're part of the team, they're in the stand-ups, they realize it has changed. It's up to them to keep the test set updated. It's also often up to them to automate the test set, particularly in, um, particularly in the way that agile teams are moving today, which is more and more towards automation. So it's often the responsibility of an STE or an SDET, right? Were there any other questions? Yes. That is, 
that's one of the reasons that we made this a management track and an advanced idea. If you're not able to act as a change agent, it's very difficult to do. If in my position, because I'm a director, people have to listen to what I have to say, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I have an easier time getting change implemented than someone else does. But many of you, you may not be in a management position or not yet, but that doesn't mean you aren't a leader. They can say, oh, you know, uh, John has never steered us wrong before. We're going to try this. Particularly if you have, have a tendency to have a lot of errors in production or uh, you're a collaborative company and it would fit well into your environment. A lot of times the way I have got people to try something when I have not been in a position where I can easily act as a change agent is say, let's just target something. Let's just try it. And if you can success breed success. If you can be successful on one small thing, they will let you try it on larger things. So that's a way sometimes to, to get buy-in is say, let's just try it. Look at what this has done in other companies. Let's try it. Yes. Yes. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Our, the teams that I work with now love this process so much that they now use it for more things than just testing. We actually have collaborative uh, user stories. This is how we write our user stories, too. And it's just because it became so popular after the testing that they found it was valuable to have at least those three areas represented when they were writing user stories and breaking them down. So, is that it? If you have any other questions, ping me. I will definitely be around for the next couple days or you can contact me. Here's my contact information. The other thing is it's a value to actually train your staff. I run training sessions for my own staff. New people join our organization and I'll run uh, a new collaborative test session. I'm here local in Portland and I also have a team in California. So if you're interested in having training, I, I don't make my living through consulting. So that I'm, talking, I'm not talking about anything where you would be charged for anything. I'm just saying if you have people who would like to join that kind of class, if we're running one in Portland or California, ping me. Or if you're local and you'd like some specific training, ping me. Because there are ways you can train your Agile teams to do this, and they're fun, fun ways to do it. So just let me know. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Have a great day.